No longer are we all just hugging trees. We've moved on. If you listen carefully to the comments we recorded recently, you'll see that Australians are grasping the environmental and social bulls by the horns. Kevin Davin, with all his experience, is a perfect example of how far we've come. Well, if people like John Burge and, and Kevin Davin had talked about social issues interacting with, uh, with investments uh, 15 years ago, uh, then we would have frightened the horses. Uh, uh, clearly, I think that, uh, that uh, it is much more acceptable in the community, but more importantly, uh, people now see the, the real mood. Uh, I mean, I see uh, uh, politicians uh, uh, of uh, both uh, uh, persuasions who uh, have uh, become born again uh, even in the last six or eight weeks. Uh, so uh, we're going to get a lot of help, I think, in, uh, in terms of our endeavours in this direction. Environmental risk is going to be something that we'll be looking at in the future in a way that we haven't looked at in the past. I think risk management and, and things like um, you know, bird flu or whatever else it mm -hmm. might be, but those sort of how, how um, companies uh, uh, manage their um, preparedness and their risk for those sort of external shocks are, are the type of things that we haven't necessarily um, had much focus on. Um, I'd like to see the uh, superannuation industry take more of a leadership role in uh, education of members and the industry in general on environmental and climate change concerns. I think Australian trustees have become extremely sophisticated about a whole range of things and becoming more interested, for example, in environmental and social risk as well as pure governance risk and so they're, they're broadening the range of their interest and the, the range of their analysis and the things that they're going to take into account in making investments within and outside Australia. Thank you Deborah and good afternoon. What I'm going to cover is in three parts. Firstly, can traditional analysis deal with the new trends, the new social trends for example that we're talking about? Secondly, what are those trends? What, are those, what is that new environment that I'm raising that is actually having an impact on the investment problem? And lastly, do we need new analysis to deal with this new world, this new set of challenges? So let's begin with the first. Why am I even asking the question, can traditional analysis deal with these new trends? And if I had to put it simply, it would be like this. About three quarters of the value of the typical Australian company is made up of intangibles. It's made up of intangible things like intellectual property, like human capital, like having great processes, like having great quality processes. It's having a reputation that next year um, you're going to want to go and buy that service or that good because in the past it's worked well or other people have said it's worked well. That's true across the Australian economy, as I've pointed out here, three quarters of the value of Australian shares are actually made up by, of intangibles. Can traditional research methods cope with that? Now, traditional research methods are often focused around things like this. Is there a good and sound strategy? And in particular, does it have a strong competitive advantage? What about the Porter principles? What about suppliers, consumers, and so on and so on? If those things are all good, but my question is, are they enough in an intangible world? Is competitive advantage actually increasingly, much more than before, around innovation? I didn't mention, if we looked at that stat of 77% 25 years ago, it was the other way around. Things are changing. Is competitive advantage increasingly around innovation? The new corporate environment, or the new trends, what are some of the big trends that are impacting companies in this new intangible world. For example, are we moving from a time when capital is king to a time when labour is king? We're seeing a whole change in technology. Is that influencing the value within companies? What I've got for you now is five of the more interesting forces we see that are impacting the intangible um, valuation of a company. So climate change, commitment from the uncommitted, right sourcing, the, th the search for authenticity and meaning, and informational democracy. But let's start with climate change. This is something which I think most of you will be aware of, that I guess the scientist's issue is that there is accelerating climate change and the carbon um, concentration in the atmosphere and the temperatures are rising. The second part of that issue is what do we do about it? The point of the scientists is 
To prevent dangerous interference with climate, climatic systems, the overall global temperature increase should not exceed two degrees above the pre-industrial level. So that's their benchmark of when things um, go from bad to worse. You see the red line? That's the um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's expectation of the amount of carbon that will be emitted um, if we do nothing about it till 2010. Uh, sorry, 2100. And the greenish line is what would happen if we stabilise the carbon emissions uh, in the atmosphere at 550 parts per million. Now, that would then bring us to the, what they think is, an, is the right level. What does that actually mean for business? Well, it actually means that we have to get an 85% decrease in carbon emissions compared to business as usual by 2100. As investors, we then need to be aware of how that's going to impact our investments. If we go back to the very beginning, the first time it was ever referred to was in 1898, when a Swedish scientist brought up the whole idea. Eventually, 81 years later, um, we had the first World Climate Conference um, in 1979. And the pace has been picking up ever since. As investors, we need to be aware that there is an accelerating global response to climate change and that's likely to have an impact on companies. These are the sort of stats that you get from the global reinsurers who, if you think about it, care about the climate down the track because they're already insuring for the consequences. And what they're pointing out is that in real terms, economic losses from natural catastrophes are increasing significantly and the insured losses are also increasing significantly. And you're already finding them adjusting their premiums on the back of it. But how do we actually do, uh, deal with accelerating climate change? Some of the things we look at are these. The product and geographic exposure of the different companies, but also understanding the physical impacts, the value chain exposures. Are senior management actually on top of the issue? Can they actually discuss the numbers? Do they measure it? We get to the point where within different industries, we try and work out which ones we think are the leaders and hence are on top of the risks or are taking advantage of the opportunities. I was asked by the organisers to give some suggestions to any trustees who are particularly interested in this um, climate change issue. Three things I came up with were these. Firstly, you could consider joining the investors group on climate change. Um, secondly, when you go to choose your fund managers, you may want to choose those that are better able to analyse the risk and opportunities around climate change. And thirdly, I would recommend that you be really on top of the Australian Emissions Trading Scheme, which may come into being in the next year or two in order to start in 2010. The second trend is this, commitment from the uncommitted, or the new war for talent. Workers are clearly becoming scarcer in the long term. Just the demographics tell us that. The workers are now going to begin to reduce as a portion of our population. Secondly, workers are actually scarcer in the short term because of the low unemployment rate we have in Australia. And next, that's all happening at a time when people, employees, are less committed to their employers. So if you look at the generational studies that people do, and just focus on the right-hand column, you see that the expected job length for Gen Y, which is, say, 20-year-olds, um, is three years rather than six. Their influences are things like uh, people and things like, I guess, friends, um, the web, and so on, rather than experts. When they look for jobs, they're more focused on things like honesty, respect, and the opportunity for learning and development than they are stability. And when they go to apply for a job, 72% of them say they will not actually even apply for a job if they don't believe in what the company stands for. The modern employer is asking for commitment from the uncommitted. Most of us would, would expect good human capital management should lead to better staff satisfaction, which should lead to better customer satisfaction, and both those two should lead to better financial performance. How does it work overall? Again, from a couple of um, studies around better employers, we see these stats. Higher revenue growth, higher profit growth, and higher total return from better employers. If you're doing a good job of people management, you really are likely to see that flow through to financial consequences. So that's my second trend. 
Third one, right sourcing, uh, a fine balance. What do I mean by that? Well, firstly, outsourcing is an interesting idea and a term that we hear a lot. And here, interestingly enough, I've talked about right sourcing. Why is that? Well, firstly, there are problems we all know with too little outsourcing. So Pacifica, a company making automotive parts, I think most people would argue has had too little outsourcing. It reduced their speed to market, increases capital cost, and in particular, China was very good in it, and those companies that outsourced to China did a lot better than those that didn't. On the other hand, you can go the other way. You can actually have too much outsourcing. What are the risks there? Well, if you get it wrong, you may actually have quality problems. You may actually have brand risk. You may have employee relations problems, and you certainly couldn't lose control. And an example of that would be Nike, where they outsourced the making of their shoes and so on to Asia, but didn't control it very well. As a consequence, they found out that, that a lot of the stuff was being made in the production lines by underage workers. That had a big negative consequence back up the line all the way through to consumers in terms of their reputation and brand and so on. So I think we need to move what has been the, I guess, common thinking that outsourcing is good to the thought that right sourcing is good. Some of the things you need to think about are some of these. Is, is there, um, for example, good occupational health and safety? Is there quality assurance? Think again of the Nike example and so on. The fourth trend I wanted to cover, the search for authenticity and meaning. You remember the stat that I gave you before. The portion who will not apply for a job if they do not believe in what the organisation stands for. So Gen Y, 72% won't apply nowadays versus 25% um, for other generations. That's interesting, but put it in from a different survey. Um, seek, I think, in this case. If you break up employees into those who say they're unhappy or, or are happy in their current job, let's look at the top two boxes. For those that are happy in their current job, 63% of the same people will say, well, actually, my company displays the values that I share. For those that are unhappy in their current job, 84% will say, my company, I disagree with the, the values that my company displays. Very strong correlation there. And why do we care? Because unsurprisingly from the same survey, happiness was the best lead indicator from all the, the measures they had on the likelihood of that person leaving the organisation. People want to work for organisations nowadays where they think they've got authenticity and meaning. The fifth um, uh, area is around informational democracy. Here's an interesting stat which won't surprise you. This is the, the number of internet domains that are in existence and the rate of growth in those. We all know that they've been growing really fast. 30% per annum is, in fact, the figure. The game has changed from getting information to filtering and getting useful information. Interesting uh, comment here, basically the um, September 11 attacks could probably have been prevented with information in the system, but nobody was able to pull it together. The general view that as you actually have more and more pieces of information, in the end you get diseconomies of scale. And there are a whole lot of things you want to think about when you think about informational democracy, the fact that there is information readily available. And an example which perhaps makes the point well would be brambles. Um, a few years back, they lost, and I think the number's about 20 million pallets in Europe. The problem was they had poor systems and they had poor incentives. The incentives are about making pallets, not about keeping track of them. They fixed that. As a consequence, they're in a much better position, and in fact, we would regard them as one of the leaders in that area in terms of really being on top of their game in terms of these particular issues. How does it all fit together? If I had to summarise it simply in one slide, it would be this. Um, as any good MBA knows, every investment should ultimately be able to value, be valued through a discounted cash flow. Price equals cash flow grown over time and then discounted back. Simplify that to a formula like this. Cash flow divided by the rate of return being the risk-free rate plus the risk premium minus the growth rate. And what does a good investment analyst need to do, no matter what their, their particular asset class, they need to spend a lot of time on the risk and the growth because those will be the two key things of which will set apart whether this is a good investment or a bad investment. In a tangible world, all these things we've been talking about, a committed workforce, right sourcing, being on top of climate change opportunities and risks and so on, all impact on the risk premium of different investments and on the growth of different investments. And that's how they find their way into the investment problem.
Thank you.